is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. All right, so now we're starting Chapter 53, The Wheel Turns. The last and chapter of the Eye of the World. The very last chapter, guys. You, If you're listening to this, you have probably listened to all the other ones, which is amazing, and thank you. I guess we can at least say that about uh, for this last chapter. Thanks for listening. Yep. It has been... We started this not knowing what we are doing six months ago, and now it's there's kind of a flow to it, and... Way we do. I feel like we know what we're doing now. Well, I never <laughs> I mean, feel like more. I know what I'm doing. But <laughs> I feel like uh, the community is ama- – that's that's the one thing I have – you know, I knew we ha- could do the podcast. Yeah. I wasn't sure about the quality, and I wasn't sure about the community. And the community has come through in a way that I never expected. I mean, it's just been – constant offers of help and financial help and yeah we've had uh, to turn people down because we just couldn't accept any more free help yeah or like i just don't know how to use people sometimes you know we people but people have offered all sorts of other things i think someone offered to buy us like furniture once they're like, I'm going to IKEA. You guys need anything? And oh you're yeah. Like, what? <laughs> uh, um, no. I don't know what to ask <laughs> <Thank> for. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't. We weren't really sure how to ha- even handle some of the offers of help. I think that's really the. Yeah. Well, it's just been really awesome. Oh, yeah. Like we didn't even start a Patreon until people were like, "Hey, how do we send you money?" And we were like, "Uh, no, we just like <laughs> figured that out." You really? You want to? Really? Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, these are our friends. They're uh, they're here to help us out. And and what I really love is when I pop into, I'll pop into the Discord channel, and there'll be like a whole conversation that happened when I was like at work or something. Yeah. And I'll be like, oh, that's this whole community going on. Like, <laughs> even when we're not there, it's wonderful. And people getting to know each other. It's it's just, it's great. But we love you guys. So thank you. Yeah. And thanks so much for listening to this last chapter. The wheel turns. Dawn revealed devastation in the green man's garden. The ground was thick with fallen leaves, almost knee-deep in places. All the flowers were gone, except a few clinging desperately to the edge of the clearing. Little could grow in the soil under an oak, but a thin circle of flowers and grass centered on the thick trunk above the green man's grave. The oak itself retained only half its leaves, and that was far more than any other tree had. As if some remnant of the green man still fought to hold there, the cool breezes had died, replaced by a growing, sticky heat. The butterflies were gone, the birds silent. It was a silent group who prepared to leave. So this, they spent a full day at the Eye of the World. It sounds like it. Because there was the battle, and then Rand was sort of lying there watching the sun pass over the sky, and then they spent the night, and now it's the next dawn. Yeah. Okay. So it's taken about a day for the Blight to encroach on... The green man's place. That sounds right. And Loyal notices it here. That was the next thing I have. I, I had one question. Egwene says, I wish he had found his other place. Yeah. I didn't, I don't know what she's talking about there. Do you? Yeah, I do. Um, green man says something. Let me see if I can find it really quick. The scarred leafy head shook slowly from side to side. I know an ending when it comes, I said I. I will find another place to make things grow. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Moraine says, you have kept the faith better than most of us who gave you the charge. That's right. And hes they're just talking about the fact that, that now that Moraine is here, the eye of the, this is an end to the eye of the world. Yeah. Interesting just how prescient he was about that. Prescient? Prescient? I think it's prescient. Prescient. I only know how to pronounce prescience and prescient because of the Dune series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. It is not right, Loyal said, staring at the oak. The Ogier was the only one not s- still mounted. It is not right that the tree brother should fall to the plight. He handed the reins of his big horse to Rand. Not right. Lan opened his mouth as the Ogier walked to the great oak. Moraine, lying on the litter, weakly raised her hand, and the warder said nothing. Before the oak, Loyal knelt 
closing his eyes and stretching out his arms. The tuft on, tufts on his ears stood straight as he lifted his face to the sky, and he sang. Nothing quite brings out the passion in Loyal like the death of a tree. Yeah. Just a couple other scenes where he gets really upset, which isn't because he's, he's so hard to... He doesn't really stir for very much else. No. no. Books and trees. <laughs> he's, uh... I mean, he is a hero, though. You know, he... Uh, we never see him do very heroic things, and he describes them as not very heroic, but if you look carefully, you see him fight to defend women and children. You see him, you know, stand... I think at one point he guards a door in the stone uh, against the Trollocs during the raid and, like, stands alone against, like, many, many, many Trollocs to protect oh, women that and right? children. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to get there. Uh, and there's just a couple of the scenes like that where he's like, hmm, I, I did nothing. And they're like, yeah, you just took down that like fist of Trollocs by yourself. And he's like, yeah, you know, they kind of made me a little upset. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, don't mess with Ogier. They are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever we see Ogier actually fighting, they're they're kind of. I've talked about this before, but I yeah, love the awesome. Ogier in the last battle. Oh, I so wish there good. was more. And like Sean Chan Ogier. Oh, uh, yeah. Those are really cool, too. Oh, there's a good piece of fan art out there with a, a Sean Chen shoulder, soldier standing next to a um, Ogier Gardner. Yeah, they're Gardner. Called. That's right. I think they're, they're they're like the only Death Watch guards that aren't owned by the... The Empress? The Empress? Yeah. Or something like that. They but have a like, special status. There's a cool scene here where Lael starts singing... Ren could not say if there were words, or if it was pure song. In that rumbling voice, it was as if the earth sang, yet he was sure he heard the birds trilling again, and spring breezes sighing softly, and the sound of butterfly wings. Lost in song, he thought it lasted only minutes, but when Loyal lowered his arms and opened his eyes, he was surprised to see the sun stood well above the horizon. It had been touching the trees when the yogir had begun. The leaves still on the oak seemed greener, and more firmly attached than before. The flowers encircling it stood straighter, the morning stars white and fresh, the lover's knots a strong crimson. And so this is the singing talent. You know, we see it from the Ogier. We see it in Rand's flashback in the Terangriel. Yeah. And then we see Rand use it later to grow the oak trees when he's in the conference about the last battle. And Loyal's supposed to be one of the most talented tree, tree singers out there. In the modern in the modern age, although this this looks like pretty powerful magic, but Loyal says uh, shortly after this that he wouldn't have been able to do that if this hadn't been the Green Man's grave. He says something like, "I could feel him in there. I've never sung so hard before." This is Loyal talking. I could not have done it if something of the Tree Brother was not still there. My tree songs do not have his power. When he settled himself in his saddle. There was satisfaction in the look he gave the oak and the flowers. This little space, at least, will not sink into the blight. You're a good man, Ogier, Lan said. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that as a compliment. Which is, I, I feel like that's like, because um, like he's not a man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like. Oh, I'm trying to think of a decent analogy. But what do you but say? Like, you know, you're a yeah. good Ogier, Ogier. Right. <laughs> And also, you know, Lan, of course, respects him because Lan's fight is against the Blight that has taken over his homeland, and Loyal has just created an area that is safe from the Blight. Yeah, it made me wonder a little. We don't know very much about tree singing or how it works or what's possible. We don't know a ton. We know a little. But it, it made me wonder if this is permanent. Will this space always now be I think so. protected from the Blight? That's what I... That's the way I... So yeah, I, I, well, and and it only has to last another two years or so. Yep, true. <laughs> <laughs> and then the blight gets uh, defeated. So I, I assume it lasts the whole way. So they turn off into the blight, and as they're as they're moving, this is just shortly after that. I noted that everything's still. Not a single branch trembled as if to lash at them. Nothing screamed or howled. Neither nearby nor in the distance, the blight seemed to crouch, nor to pounce, but as if it had been struck a great blow and waited for the next to fall, even the sun was less red. 
And I wondered about this here. And the next paragraph is this weird thing that I, I couldn't couldn't really wrap my head around where Rand's looking at the Seven Towers. Mm-hmm. Did you notice any of that? And he mm-hmm. like says like the towers appear to be higher and... I couldn't understand. I couldn't figure out if that's a, meant to be like an after image that Rand's seeing, like what they were, or so. What is yeah, that? Yeah, I've got opinions. Okay. The blight is not a natural place. Oh, I think I already see where this is going. Okay. We see, for example, in the cave, the Dark One is able to make the ceiling height change. Yeah. So I I think in some ways the thinness in the reality that they talk about Mm -hmm. allows Telerani Riyadh to have a little more influence in the real world. And so perhaps by breaking the Dark One's power, you're breaking the power of the Blight a little bit. And that is reflected in the real world through the image or the idea of the seven towers being taller and that sort of being projected into the real world. So if you strike a blow Mm -hmm. to the dark one and his power wanes, then what, what the dark one has done is not undone, but going there. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And, And there's just a little bit of that. What you perceive is what is actually happening going on. Mm hmm. Rand describes it as something almost seen. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, you know, he goes into the world of dreams when he ascends those steps. So who knows how much of the blow he struck was in Teleron Riyadh, in the world of dreams. You know, yeah. and we also don't know a lot about how exactly the Dark One affects the weather. How had he been pulling, extending out the winter? You know, what exactly did Rand do to break that? Right. And Rand gets in this fight with Ishmael. Why why does that affect the blight? I think the release of power, you know, he, he all of the eye of the world is being released. Yeah. And all of that power is being flung out. And some of it destroys the Trollocs and some of it, you know, takes out the army and he uses some of it to defeat Ishmael. Some of it may just be you know, like when he fights in Ruidion, he destroys the magical dome mm-hmm. and with a lot of bale fire, and, and, that, and that whole thing changes because of the battle. And I'm thinking that possibly through the massive release of power, he's broken whatever hold the Dark One had simply by letting that power out. Yeah. Just sort of caught in the destruction, loosening the Dark One's grip and the, the grip of the Blight a little bit on the world. That's interesting. But the only way I could see with the the whole the tops of the towers coming back and flying a little higher higher is somehow like in the final battle we see this blending of the real world and Teleron Riyadh and that maybe that's happening a little bit here. Yeah. No, that 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 makes sense to me. The blight kind of emanates or and becomes weaker as it extends from mm-hmm. Shale Ghoul to if you were to I don't know, shake up the dark one a bit. It, the blight might just. And I could sort of see it as the dark one is pushing as hard as he can against the world through his seals. And after this blow, maybe he's just sort of pulled back a little bit and he's not like touching the seal quite as hard. And that like corruption maybe has faded a little bit from the world. Yeah, the weather as well. It seems to be like beautiful and perfect immediately. So it's, it, it's isn't in spring like overnight. Right. It's a little later with Agalmar, I think, but there's something something about like wildflowers mm-hmm. that doesn't happen in one day. Wildflowers can bloom overnight. I, if you've I ever guess. been in like yeah. Texas desert and you get one of those um flash flood storms, you wake up the next morning and all the seeds that were sitting there waiting for water bloom overnight and they they grow really fast. That's true to take advantage of the, the very brief period of time with water. It also made me wonder how much Ishmael may have had to do with the weather as opposed to the dark one, dire- uh, uh, as the dark one directly. 
Yeah. Not that I'm questioning the dark one didn't have anything to do with it, but I losing Ishmael seemed to be a really big blow. It does. It, it maybe Ishmael and and the even if he himself wasn't doing anything, maybe the dark one was doing it through the conduit to Ishmael. Yeah. And by cutting that off, he's cutting off the Dark One's connection to the world. I wondered about that a bit with the the sword made out of light, where and he cuts the this tether mm-hmm. to the Dark One. And later, when he does it with Asmodian, he describes it as his connection to the Dark One. His um, basically, his pledge is a dark friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I cut him off from the Dark One, is what he says. And so that's what he does here to Ishmael. He cuts him off from the Dark One. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing, yeah, so what I'm thinking is by cutting him off from the Dark One, whatever power or whatever connection the Dark One had to the world has been partially severed. I like that theory that the Dark One was better able to touch the world because he had these powerful channelers, or at least a powerful channeler, to work through. Mm-hmm. Because later we see he gets the the avatar of Shadar Haran, mm-hmm. but until then, he really has to work indirectly through the Forsaken. But yeah, this is a weird one. This is one of those, again, those uh, Eye of the World-isms that... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's weird. I don't, I don't know why they appear taller. I also noticed very next paragraph that Moraine has Nynaeve and Egwene help her set up the wards. I was wondering if she was making a little um, circle. I, that's what I thought is she must be basically making a three person circle and using their raw power to help her set up. I don't think that she's getting them to do it themselves. No, she would have to direct. They wouldn't know what they were doing. Right. So yeah, I assume she's she's actually forming, because you know, like we see Egwene later on when she's the Armalyn, she teaches the novices how to form a circle pretty quickly and pretty easily. Yeah, but they, you know, but they don't really have the basic training in opening themselves up to the one power. So, mm, it's hard to say. It's hard yeah. to say what's going on here. It sounds like a circle, but it seems improbable that they have the skill to do that already. And this this is another one of those things where we see like it's from Rand's perspective and it's at a distance and he doesn't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's not really laid out, but I thought that was interesting. And you know, this these are one of those spots where it's possible Jordan didn't have every single detail worked out in his head. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we we are still very very early into a long long series. That's true. Um, and we like to pretend that everything is totally internally inherently consistent. That's not always true. <laughs> it probably isn't, but like I've said before, I prefer to believe. <laughs> I do, I choose to believe that this the whole thing is perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just too dumb to understand. That's the st- <laughs> I, I think that's definitely a premise that we may not have said out loud, but that we tend to stick with. Yeah. That that this is, you know, if this is true, if this thing happened. What are the consequences? What would have led up to that? Let's right. How we can we, we explain this? How can we explain this? We don't dismiss it as oh, the writer messed up. We treat it as something that happened in world. Yeah, and try and figure out why the characters are doing that. I think that served as well. Yeah, it's been fun anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if we can get through the eye of the world by doing that, we can definitely get through the rest of it because I think the eye of the world has the most stuff that's incongruent with the rest of the series. Yeah. Yeah, when they're talking about spring, if they say, it was if spring, so long held back by winter, now race to catch up to where it should be. So it's like in one day, like they have the first like three months of spring. Yeah, it seems like seems like it. I noticed Perrin noticed feeling the blight, that the blight's acting differently. But Moraine doesn't really give us answers. She says, um, the shadow will be a long time recovering. How? Matt demanded. What did we do? Sleep, Moraine said. (laughs) We're not out of the blight yet. She remarks the same thing again as they're moving along. And then they start running into soldiers, I think. Uh, Well, they they, they get to the border of the blight. Oh, gotcha. And all the men are just, they're coming out and being like, oh, wow, that was... What the hell happened yesterday? (laughs) 
it was a great victory, you know, because they, they, they heard about the victory at the Gap. Mm-hmm. And so they're all like celebrating because they, you know, five days ago or 10 days ago, however long it was when they first demanded in their fields, they pretty much thought they were going to be overwhelmed. Yeah. They all thought they were going to die. Yeah. They, I mean, they evacuated the city. Or to the city? Did they go in it or did they leave it? I can't remember. I thought they all the farmers left their fields and went into the keep, the protected forest. Yeah. Fortress. So they didn't like flee south, but they fled into the protected for, protected castle behind the walls. I'm nodding. That sounds right. We see a lot of shouting from the soldiers. Things like victory in the gap and the light has conquered the shadow and all these. A miracle in the gap. The light I, blesses us with spring once more. I do find it interesting that Moraine is being carried on a litter. I mean, she must be really, really beat up. Yeah. She's like, I'm fine, but like... She's not she's fine. She's not fine. She got she got hurt pretty bad. She says only my pride is injured, uh, which is something I say <laughs> <laughs> a good amount. Um, only my pride is injured and these bleeding, gaping wounds. But those those are fine. Those are fine. No big deal. So right. Don't worry about that. That's another thing. We don't we don't really know much about what happened, but we know that she fights Agonor. Agonor. No. Yeah, Agonor. She delays him with the the big fireball. Yeah. And he steps through it, and then Bran runs, and then she starts screaming. So we don't actually see what happens, but we know that she's. Her clothing is burned, and she looks pretty beat up, and she can't seem to stand. But, you know, it could be part from channeling too much or just whatever he torture weave mm-hmm. that I imagine he used. Yeah, I imagine just pain. We see Ingtar, who's yeah sour-faced. Ingtar's was the first face Rand saw that was not smiling. I was too late, Ingtar told Lan with a sour grimace. Too late by an hour to see. Peace. His teeth ground audibly, but then his expression became quite contrite. Forgive me. Grief makes me forget my duties. And to me, he's not at all pissed. I mean, he's pissed that he couldn't make it, but not because, like... Yeah, this is a weird scene. Yeah, I mean, he's a dark friend. He wants wants to be there. He was probably commanded to be there in case he could do something for the dark. And I imagine the fact that he had to escort them and was unable. I think we talked about this a little bit when he left them at the border. Uh Uh-huh. But that, like, he really is in no position to help the dark side at all at any point. No. And he's, like, really frustrated with that. Because we see what fades do to someone who's, like... If he's commanded to, you know, do something at the battle and he doesn't show up, he could be punished for that. Yeah. Sadly, we don't know. But no. something weird's happening there. Moraine commands him to take her to Lord Aglemar. Angtar opened his mouth to protest and bowed under the force of her eyes. Aglemar was in his study. Kind of breeze through this first part here, mm-hmm. where a lot of greetings and sideline stuff. But the next thing I have is where Moraine says, we hear, I don't know if you have anything in between here, but we hear, Moraine said as soon as the door shut behind Dingtar, that you won a great victory in Tarwin's Gap. Yes, Agelmar said slowly, his troubled frown returning. Yes, I said I, and no. The half-men and their trollocs were dest- destroyed to the last, but we barely fought. A miracle, my men call it. The earth swallowed them. The mountains buried them. Only a few drag car were left, too frightened to do else but fly north as fast as they could. A miracle indeed, Moraine said. And spring has come again. A miracle, Agelmar said, shaking his head. But, Moraine said I, men say many things about what happened in the gap. That the light took on flesh and fought for us. That the creator walked in the gap to strike, strike at the shadow. But I saw a man, Moraine said I. I saw a man, and what he did cannot be, must not be. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Lord of Thaldara, as you say, Moraine. So he saw Rand. Yeah. Or I assume that he doesn't know that it was Rand. I think he does. Yeah? Because, I mean, he's like, I saw a man, and he shouldn't, you know, I don't think he's naming him, but he's like, you took this dude up and up into the thing. He did something he shouldn't be able to do, which is channel. And Agelmar's no dummy. And Agelmar is no dummy. He has already speculated, I forgot about this, but he already 
without really saying it, he was like, wait, are they? And Moraine gives him a non-answer answer or something like that. Mm-hmm. He basically is like, can they channel? And she's like, the Weasleys. Oh, I think she says they're Tavarin. The or Tavarin. Like yeah, that. yeah, the Tavarin excuse. <laughs> Here she's even more. She's doesn't. He's like. That can't be, and she pulls her. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. Just like her, just non-answer. Like you know, shit happens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's like that. That can't be. Shit happens. You know, like that's that's such a non-answer. Yeah. yeah. Shit happens is our world's version of the wheel weaves as the wheel wills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should just replace shit happens everywhere in the story. Like replace. The the wheel wheels, the shit happens, everyone in the story. Shit happens, Lord of Thaldara. <laughs> As, <laughs> As you, you say. say. <laughs> um, but I, you know, and especially later when they go hunt the horn, doesn't Lord Algamar give Rand second in command to Ingtar? I believe that's right. I wonder if that's partially because he knows. Could be. It could be for a couple different reasons. Moraine might say something else that we don't necessarily see. True, true. But also, man, recently I keep going back to that, like that one where when Rand's Tavarin nature gets really strong later, and mm-hmm. like crazy stuff happens where people say things they don't didn't want to, or you know, sure, like you could just make a decision that seems right at the time, and it could have just been because he's surrounded by Tavarin, you know. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I see this as like, you know how he kind of appears in the sky over um, Falma? And everyone yeah. like sees his face and, and there's those paintings of him everywhere. This is sort of like, he just, uh, he appears in the gap and Algamar recognizes him. I like that. But I mean, also, even from Algamar's perspective, if no one ever tells him anything and he doesn't see Rand's face, I feel like he could still put a lot of this together. Sure. Like... He already thought it was the end. Like people were thinking that like this is this is the last battle happening right now, like mm-hmm. beginning right now. And then this crazy stuff happens right after an Aes Sedai and Lan, not just a warder, but Lan. Yeah. Go off into the blight with these five nameless or Yeah. A, well a, an Ogier and four M- Five. Five. <laughs> Five, Five nameless, uh, you know, Village sheep folk. herders with hay in their hair, and then this happens. And he sees a man channeling. Yeah. Um, Land takes a special liking to him mm-hmm. right after this, and yeah, something is happening. They're not telling me, but... No. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm moving forward with the assumption that, that Algamar at least knows that Rand is a channeler. I think he's, he has to assume. Mm-hmm. Or something. Mm-hmm. Moraine asks about Pad and Fane. Aglemar says he's still there. What of you in the blight? Moraine said, I, you found the green man? I see his hand in the new things growing. We found him, she said flatly. The green man is dead, Lord Aglemar, and the eye of the world is gone. There will be no more requests by young men seeking glory. Aglemar doesn't believe it. She s- says, um, how could the green man be dead? Like, I thought you won. Mm-hmm. Well... She's like, yeah, we did, but... You'd think a soldier would get, like, you can win a battle and still lose people. Yeah. We won, Lord Aglemar. We won, and the land is freed from winter, and the land freed from winter is proof, but I fear the last battle has not yet been fought. And then Rand, like, you know, almost speaks up and is like, I killed Shaitan! And she's like, shut up! No, <laughs> no you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the blight still stands, and the forges of Thak and Dar still work below Shale Ghoul. There are many half-men yet, and countless Trollocs. Never think the need for watchfulness in the borderlands is gone. I did not think so, I said I, he said stiffly. That's like a kind of an insult. Or it's a little, yeah, not well, an insult. I don't think she means it to be insulting, but she's kind of like putting him in his place a little. A little bit. Well, I mean, he was, he asked kind of a dumb question. Right? <laughs> yeah, like, is it over? Or not that exactly, but yeah. then Moraine... Motion for Loyal to set the gold chest at her feet, and when he did, she opened it, revealing the horn. Why is she so insistent the horn has to go to Ilion? I was kind of wondering that myself. Especially when later she takes it to Tarvalin. Is there a prophecy about it? No. I mean, the the hunt for the horn has always started in Ilion. Yeah. But it doesn't really have to... 
But the horn doesn't have to go there. You know, it sounds like she wants to use it as like a standard bearer and rally the forces of the light and sort of like hold it up as a a talisman. Hmm. Yeah, she says something about rallying the forces of the light. I mean, she can't lie. She probably just assumes it's the best thing to do with it that because the hunt is there, that if you if you bring it to Ilian, then that's where people will flock because that is always yeah. where the great hunt is called. And I can't remember the exact sequence of events, but did the they intend I think she intends to bring it to Ilian and it's stolen. Yeah, absolutely. So they go chasing and then oh geez, uh what happens after that? Well, there's the whole great hunt. They get the dagger and the horn back mm-hmm. in Falma. Matt blows it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Matt has to go back to the tower for healing. Um, and so he takes the dagger and the horn back to the tower. Gotcha. Yeah, they stay in the box together. Yeah. Agalmar really wants the horn. And like we were saying, Moraine insists that it be taken to Ilian. I wonder how much that is just to prevent glory seekers on the border from using it just to attack the blight. I think part of it's got to be in there. Mm -hmm. But like really she just wants to get it out of the borderlands because there are too many people who would use it for glory, which it's not supposed to be used for. And Agelmar says, it shall be as you say, I said I, but when the lid of the chest closed, Lord of Faldara looked like a man being denied his last glimpse of the light. And so a week goes by. And bells are still ringing in Faldara. I mean, that, that's a great victory. You send out a giant army expecting to get slaughtered, probably most of your men, and they come back. Yeah, and the people too. I guess it says here, the people had returned from Felmoran, so they went to the capital, adding their celebration to that of the soldiers. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. I think Felmoran is where they, is near the gap. Oh, it's one of the other cities. I'm, yeah. I can't remember. Oh, sorry. Falmoran, that's where the people fled. Okay. So the people, you know, we were talking about them in the field. Yeah. They didn't flee to the castle. They fled to another city further away. Gotcha. Is that, I don't, can't remember if that's the capital or not, but it's another one of the cities. Another one of the cities in the border, in, 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 um, Shinar. I just have this dialogue between, um, Lan and Matt, or <laughs> Lan and Rand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> about being a blade master? Yeah. Good, Sheeperder. Leaning against the railing with his arms folded across his chest, the warder watched him critically. You are doing well, but don't push so hard. You can't become a blade master in a few weeks. The void vanished like a pricked bubble. I don't care about being a blade master. It's a blade master's blade, Sheeperder. I just want my father to be proud of me. Anyway, I don't have a few weeks, he says after putting his sword away. Then you've not changed your mind? Would you? Land's expression had not altered. The flat planes of his face looked as if they could not change. You won't try to stop me, or Moraine said I? You can do as you will, sheepherder, or as the pattern weaves for you. The word is straightened. I'll leave you now. I had imagined that Lan has been instructed not to push Rand in any particular way. Because I think that Moraine doesn't necessarily know what to do right now. It, and I perceived her not talking to him as either being partially sick, partially busy, but also, like, Rand and the boys need to do whatever it is they need to do. And she doesn't know, but she knows that the pattern will put them there. And I think she knows at this point that anything that she suggests, Rand will not do just for the sake of not being manipulated. I mean, they just had a confrontation yeah. about being him being used as a false dragon. Yeah. And so... If she tries to manipulate him at all, he's going to be like, no, you're not going to use me as a false dragon. And so she's just like, fine. I'm stepping back. You do what you want. Not that she doesn't have, you know, control and is planning on manipulating him anyway. Yeah. <laughs> which she does a lot. <laughs> which, which I think she is doing by not talking to him. Oh, totally. And then all the things with the clothes that we see later. Um, oh, yeah. In the next book and like getting the banner and getting him to be second in command to Ingtar. And, you know, she does all of this stuff to make sure that he is forced into command without ever actually talking to him about it. And we see this in a second, but Rand and Aguin have a conversation after Lan leaves where Rand basically explains to her that he's planning on leaving. He wants to get a, 
Well, in his head, he like wants to get away from anyone he could hurt. Right. Um, and all these thoughts about not channeling and the last paragraph, which I'll read as I, as I normally do, but is Moraine listening. She's listening to the whole conversation. Oh, she's keeping extremely close tabs on him. Yeah. She knows exactly what he's thinking at all times. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's anything in this conversation you want to point out, but. Just them, him complaining about Moraine not paying attention to him, and then, you know, and he's sort of like, "Is she going to gentle me?" You know, th- it's a pretty raw conversation between uh, Rand and Aguin, just about, yeah, basically the fact that he's a channeler. Oh, and then there's uh, Rand saying, "Oh, I won't ever touch it again. Not if I have to cut my right hand off first, or my own hand off." He doesn't say right hand, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, so Samurag <laughs> will be more than happy to Spoiler. oblige you. <laughs> uh, not only are you going to touch it, and uh, you're also going to lose your hand. Yeah. And you're going to treat it like it's nothing. Will you go home, Rand? Your father must be dying to see you. Even Matt's father must be dying to see him by now. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Even Matt. <laughs> Well, and we see those two, Abel and Tam, go to the White Tower to try and find their boys. Yeah, they're on their way right now. You think they've left already? Well, oh, I'm, no. Well, yes? I don't think so. I think it's still, I, they've been gone for a cup, a little while, but, oh, you know, they do, I don't know. It's it's hard to know the exact timeline of them when they left. Yeah. But he says that basically he once he got better, the two men immediately set off for Tarvalin. Right. So I imagine they were like a month or two behind. So Maybe. It and, would have to have been mm-hmm. much longer than... I think in one of our previous recordings, I had assumed it was a lot less. But you're right. Tam is really messed up. He wouldn't be able to just get out of bed yeah. a and, week and, later. And this first book, I think, is only about a month in time, maybe two months in time. So, so I, maybe they're leaving they're Maybe they're leaving right about now. But he definitely... By the beginning of the third book, yeah, by the beginning of the third book, they've been there and gone. Yeah. So sometime during The Great Hunt is when they show up. But The Great Hunt is probably, like I said before, the longest time span of any individual book. Oh, yeah. I remember you pointing that out. That's another thing I never really noticed. Yeah. I mean, that plus like the beginning of that and the time after The Great Hunt before The Dragon Reborn. Because they're like they're in the the hills, in the the snowy hills for a while. Yeah. Up. So that period of time is it's a big chunk of time. I guess I'll read a little bit. Start a little bit before that last paragraph. So we have the conversation with the queen. He rubbed his palm over the hilt of a sword, feeling the bronze heron. My father, home, light. How I want to see, not home. He says out loud. And the next piece of there's a lot of thoughts in between. Next piece of dialogue is, I'm going away, but not home. Not ever home. In Agelmar's private garden, under a thick bower, dotted with white blossoms, Marine shifted on her bed chair. The fragments of the seal lay on her lap, and the small gem she sometimes wore in her hair spun and glittered on its gold chain from the ends of her fingers. The faint blue glow faded from the stone, and a smile touched her lips. It had no power in itself, the stone, but the first use she had ever learned of the one power as a girl in the royal par- palace in Kyrian was using the stone to listen to people when they thought they were too far off to be overheard. The prophecies will be fulfilled, the Aes Sedai whispered. The dragon is reborn. The end of the first book of The Wheel of Time. And so she knows that Rand is the dragon. Yeah. And she's suspected for a while. And she also knows he's going to go- try to go... Well, try to go do his own thing now, which is the right thing. Mm-hmm. He does never go home. Yeah. He never, ever goes back to the two rivers. He does see Tam, but... Tam comes to him. He sees the girls that are going to the White Tower. Mm-hmm. He hears stories from Perrin, but he always protects the two rivers by never returning to it. Yeah, I think he has that conscious thought later... Mm-hmm. I feel like he won't go there because he knows he'll bring... Makes it a target. Yeah. Although Perrin makes it a big, bit of a target. But oh, yeah, sure. A bit, I mean. <laughs> pretty big target. Well, I mean, initially the the Trollocs all show up because 
Fane is trying to harry Rand. So in some right. way, Rand does make it a target, and Perrin shows up because it's being attacked. Yeah. But if Rand had shown up, it would have become, you know, the dark would have thrown a lot more at it. I'm nodding. You know, once once he reveals that's a vulnerability, they would have been after him the whole time. So he's sort of pretending not to care. He does that a lot. And then, uh, unfortunately, some of that pretending becomes reality. And that's why he has to find love again. Yeah. All right. Glossary. <laughs> Should I start reading? Our symbol is <laughs> the wheel with uh, the opera snake on it. The Toman calendar, devised by Toma Dur Amid, was adopted approximately... No, we're not really going to do that. <laughs> we're not really going to do that. <laughs> So what's going on with your laptop? Well, it's just this. I have to ship it back to Lenovo, and they're supposed to send me this, just like a shipping label that you slap on the box, and it's like supposed to be free, but it was supposed to be here by yesterday, and it's not there. So for the last couple of days, I've been like, oh, I gotta call them and like just get the address because I'm just gonna ship it myself because I'm it's sick of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, so that's what it is. What so- are you gonna do? Crappy customer service on a crappy product? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all the reviews I read of the product are good. I It just makes me wish I had bought a new one now. Well, it's life. Once you get it working, you'll be happy with it. Yeah, I know. I also uh, kind of I have a problem with <laughs> authority and bureaucracy, and I just, I know that I have to, but I hate it so much. As like, as soon as I think about calling Lenovo and just like dialing numbers for too long before I finally get to someone who I can talk to about my specific problem, I just like cringe and find something else to do. So I have to call about my medical bills. I'm months behind on that, like to the point where it's becoming a, a real financial issue because it's I just, just so, don't want to yeah. deal with the the calling the bureauc- the bureaucracy of the hospital and yeah it sucks and i have the next couple of days off so i'll handle that get it shipped yeah there's no way around it the artwork is done finally mm-hmm. as we come to the end of the eye of the world i'm chewing directly into the microphone i, I haven't been thinking about it that's yeah, fine <laughs> we do want to do the rewards for all the all of our patrons and I've been sitting on you know, the art to- artwork took way longer than I thought it would you know I was warned it would take a while but I didn't think six months I thought I was thinking like a month or two yeah wow it has been this, like the whole time the podcast has been out right much. but now that we're at the end of the eye of the world I figured that would be a good time to send out the merch that we promised the buttons and the stickers and uh, the signed copies of the artwork yeah as we do that. And then also um, putting out some patron-only episodes, or at least patron-first episodes. Yeah. Um, I think we I'll maybe have them come to the patrons for a month or two, and then... That's... Uh, I don't know if we've said this during a recording yet, but we kind of decided the way we want to do the um, the lore episodes is that we'll release them to the patrons first, but as we release more and more, eventually we'll... like So we'll have, like, say stock of like five of the lore episodes or as an example we haven't this is our, our roughly what we're gonna do and like when we have the sixth like the the sixth or the first episode that we release to the patrons will just get bumped and we'll release it regular so like these it'll just be like an advance release this way so we can do something for the people who are giving us money but eventually everyone's gonna hear the all the content so nobody has to feel bad but we do we should do something for the people who are giving us money Hmm. 
Oh, yeah. All right. Well, do you want to uh, jump into the final chapter? Stop eating popcorn? And yeah, if I can manage. Chapter? Can you hide that from me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, wait, now I'm holding it and Just I'm going to eat popcorn. Next 35 minutes, Patrick will chew <laughs> popcorn into a microphone for your listening pleasure. <laughs> Oh, you know what I was thinking of before that I kind of wanted to say out loud, but I couldn't find a good spot to put it in, was that uh, I've been running more regular lately because, like, the darkness and the crappy weather makes me not want to go out as much, so I'm, like, getting less exercise if I don't go to the gym. But that just means, like, the only exercise I really like to do is run, (laughs) so everything else that I do is just, like, as a sideline, like, well, I'm here anyway, so I'll do a few other things. Just thinking about the Aiel a lot today. Well, I, whenever I run, I think about the Aiel, like every time. And that's how I got into it. I was like, they can chase down a horse? Is that real? Can anyone do that? And I looked it up and, like, people can do that. It's cool. Horses aren't great at long distances. So that's my, has always been my goal one day. I'll um, at least run in the famous, uh, I think it's somewhere in England. They have the Man versus Horse Marathon. I'm sure I'll lose, but I, I, you know, I've been thinking about it all these years. I should do it one day. The trick is to do it in the hottest possible climate. That's what they say. Horses are no good at dealing with heat. There's a, I saw like a someone put together a spreadsheet or something. This was years ago, but basically showing that like if it's over a certain temperature, humans tend to are like way more likely to win. The temperature and distance, I think. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a marathon. I think. Oh, okay. I think it's a standard marathon, but yeah, something about they can't maintain like seven or more miles an hour over three hours or something like that. If the temperature is above, I forget what it was, but the hotter it gets, the better humans do. Then why versus, do I, so I would be a pathetic Ailman. <laughs> <laughs> Still have ne- not ran even close to a full marathon. I've run a half, but that that's it. I do terribly in the heat. Uh, you got to get used to it. And don't exactly have the healthiest habits. I stay in reasonably good shape, but drinking and smoking uh-huh. doesn't help. You're in way better shape than I am. I just bike to work. That's my only real exercise. Hey, that's really good compared to most people. Oh, it's better than nothing, but it's definitely, you know, I can tell my arms are starting to uh Yeah. Atrophy is the wrong word, but <laughs> I feel like I used to have like decently sized arms and Oh yeah, well, you're a swimmer. But yeah, from swimming. And uh I don't really then look in the mirror now and I'm like, mm, that's that's not as defined as it used to be. That reminds me, I was trying to find like my limits for lifting. So when I go to run, I like make myself do other exercises before I do that cuz that's the the only thing I really want to do. I was like trying to like got on the the bench like to to see what I could bench press. And I was like working my way up and I noticed that like I started struggling around the point where I remember I remember vividly getting to that point when I was in my freshman year of high school. Uh-huh. And like that's I haven't really gotten any stronger or I just haven't I probably was at one point but I don't the heaviest thing I lift is like a bottle of St. Germain cuz right. it's a big chunky bottle. <laughs> it's like it doesn't groceries. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. When I carry groceries home from the from the store for four blocks. Yeah, I mean I remember I don't really do anything. Else. Like maybe as a sophomore, I the first time I got on the bench press, I just put on two plates and threw up 135 pounds and did 10 reps and I was like, "Okay, that's can we put on some more weight there?" Yeah. <laughs> like I just had the muscles to like yeah, no problem. Do 135 pounds and start from there and, and go up. And they do. now I'd, I'm pretty sure I would struggle. They do um, go away after a while. Yeah. Yeah. That was the the 245s was I was like, oh, cool. Like yeah. I can still do what I did when I was uh, 15. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it took me a long time to get there, I remember, mm-hmm. when I was that young. I had a Y membership, like a YMCA membership for a lot of my childhood. For swimming? Or weightlifting? Yeah, that was some, like one of my earliest memories is like someone carrying me around in a pool and trying to teach me to lay flat, um, which is cool. And that's the, the only reason I know how to like, like, if I walked in a gym now without those experiences, I was in like a youth program, mm-hmm. summer camp and shit like that. 
but and they they had like a youth program where you could go to the gym like three times a week or something for young kids and they would have like trainers there that just walk around with you and teach you what to do if i hadn't had that i wouldn't be able to walk into a gym right now i wouldn't know how to use all that Mm -hmm. equipment I had an assistant coach in high school, and I only remember who he was, but he would just hang out in the weight room, and uh, he just there was I for some reason went in at a weird time, maybe before school or something, and he was the only one there, and he showed me how to use all the equipment, and it was just you know he's probably a fresh out of college dude, yeah, um, just helping a kid out because I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. Oh, that's so important. Yeah. I see why people are so intimidated by gyms. Just thinking, having that thought, like. I wouldn't be able to walk in there with a bunch of strangers and like and have no idea how to use this stuff, you know? And, and you can hurt yourself if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like badly. You need help to, you don't want to just start throwing heavy things around. There's etiquette too. Yeah. There is etiquette, definitely. But, you know, you also, one thing I've learned is you don't have to lift heavy weights. No. Like, do your lifting with even just, you know, 10 pounds can make a huge difference. As long as you're doing it on a regular basis. That's basically what I'm trying yeah. to do. Because I don't have to worry. I don't want to worry about like having to have someone spot me or something. I, I, when I go to the gym, I don't talk to anyone. <laughs> and my headphones are my head. wicked loud. <laughs> 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 like <laughs> Trying not even to make eye contact. Yeah. N- yeah. No. Mm-hmm. I probably should. Like I see the same people. I go at roughly the same times. Should just say what's up, you know. Fourth day in a row, if we're running into like, can we? I don't know what. I just find the gym to be a really um, poisonous is the wrong word, but depressing atmosphere. I don't enjoy being at a gym at all. It can be. I I like this one. I joined it a while back, and I wasn't really using the membership for a while. But it's like thirty bucks a month, and it's like ten blocks from my house, and it's really small. And a lot of bunch of the card the kind of gimmick is that a lot of the cardio equipment is like it, it charges the place. Like it goes oh, back okay. into the yeah. Like so a that's, green energy, like Yeah. So again, like black mirror when they're on the cycles and Exactly yeah. like that. <laughs> Except you can leave. Uh, and instead of get, getting paid, you pay to use them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cheap and it's really small. Also, there's no, there's not usually any staff there, which I th- thought was interesting. Hmm. So when you walk in, you ha- like, you sign up online, and they send you a four-digit code, and you just walk up to the door and push your personal number in, and you go in. So how do they handle like cleaning and? Is it just like after hours? Or I went there super early one morning, and it looked like the owner was there, because I knew I knew he was a young guy. He had like a picture on. I don't remember Gmail or something Mm -hmm. that I saw a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure it was him because he like vacuumed. So I'm vacuuming and I was like, huh, I wonder if he does that for his membership or something. And then he walked into the office and like was sitting there on his computer. It's like, it's probably the guy that owns the place. One person, like no employees or something like that. Yeah. It's really small. Yeah. It's like smaller than the house we lived on on 28th. Oh yeah. For a gym that's tiny. Yeah. And there's a down up, downstairs and upstairs and there's like is it is it an old house or is it no um i don't know if you'd know it's right across the street from stumptown coffee on 34th in belmont it's called the green micro gym it's right next to a bar called side street thank you for listening to the wheel of time spoilers podcast rate us in the apple podcast app or support us on patreon Is that good enough?